Our guest today is a social psychologist and associate professor of psychology at New York University. She received her PhD from Cornell and is the author of more than 70 scientific publications. Her research represents the unique intersection between social psychology, decision-making, social cognition, and perception. She's also interested in the conscious and non-conscious ways people fundamentally orient themselves to the world with a particular focus on how the motivations, emotions, needs, and goals people hold impact the basic ways that they perceive, interpret, and ultimately react to the information around them. Her work has been covered by publications such as Forbes, Time, NPR, Scientific American, and GQ, and she's recently been on Good Morning America. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcoming our guest today, author of Clear, Closer, Better, How Successful People See the World, Dr. Emily Belchedes. Hi. Emily, thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule to come on to the show. I appreciate having you here. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for that warm introduction. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Like I was talking to you before the show, feel like I got to know you through the book and the various podcasts and stuff that I've heard you on. So I'm super excited to chat with you. But before we get into this, some of the awesome stuff you talk about in the book, let's learn a little bit more about you. Where did you grow up and what was it like there? I grew up in Omaha, Nebraska. So the middle, the middle of the United States, for sure. And, you know, I had I have a younger sister. She's a musician uh, professionally, but I got to grow up with music with her. I grew up with my, uh, my parents, the musicians, um, and, and educators and therapists. And, um, yeah, I, I was, it was great. And then I went to college, uh, at the university of Nebraska at Kearney in the middle of Nebraska. And so for the first two decades of my life, I was longing <laughs> to be closer to an ocean. Uh, and then, yeah, grad school, um, at Cornell couldn't have been further from an ocean, honestly. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, that's, that's where I grew up. Omaha. I've been there once. I thought it was a pretty cool place. Uh, one of my favorite music groups is from Omaha. Do you want to guess which one? Uh, um, 311. Yes. That's the one. Yeah. Yeah. Was, yeah. yeah. I was guessing based on your age, I think yes. we're pretty similar. They were huge yeah. when, um, yeah, when we were in, when we were in high school. Yeah. Um, and yeah. you got to, actually play on stage with another legendary band from you know for us 80s and 90s kids Gold yeah Talk to us i about feel that. like i met my soulmate in you, <laughs> you know? like i had the biggest crush on 311 back in the day and like nobody talks about them anymore but um in my in my world but yeah i played with goldfinger uh at you know in the in the 90s the late 90s there was this big outdoor festival the warped tour and the warped tour came through yeah and goldfinger was one of the headlining bands and they their horn line was real big fish um and we were i you know i would music was big for my family and for me and and i had a band we were a cover band and we covered all kinds of ska punk stuff from the from the late 90s and all we knew all of goldfinger's songs the horn lines for all goldfinger songs and when they were touring without real big fish we just emailed them and um and they said yeah sure come play the show with us and so we had to spend like most of the day of of this outdoor festival trying to convince the the security guards that like our little printed email was legit and that that we should be able to go backstage to go hang out with John Feldman uh, and then and go on stage but it worked out somebody finally got tired of listening to us ask every 20 minutes if we could go backstage and and they said like we said we see him he's right there there's John Feldman like let us go and he's like you get five seconds if he doesn't recognize you instantly then you guys are out um, but luckily we got, we got recognized when we showed up and, and yeah, I got to play this awesome show for 15,000 people. Dude, that's so cool. That's taking me back, man. The warp tour was like the thing yeah. I went to all the time. Like I lived in Sacramento, California growing up. So we're fortunate enough to, to have four warp tours within driving distance. There's the one near Sacramento. There's the one in Lake Tahoe, yeah. San Francisco, and then one in Southern California. So like warp tour and summer like just both of those things are synonymous to me you totally see. i mean i just felt so lucky that we had one come through you know the midwest when when i was of of the right age to really appreciate it and you know my son he's he's about four years old now um and just last week i pulled out 
like this, this scooter, this razor scooter that I had when I was like in high school and in college, uh, because now he's old enough that he can use it. And I'm not really, I'm too old to be using those things anymore, but it's covered in all my warp tour stickers. And it just like <laughs> took me back. And, uh, you know, some of them aren't really appropriate for a four year old. Um, but he also doesn't understand what it means yet. So I get such a kick out of seeing him scoot around with all of my memorabilia from the past. I used to scoot around the UC Davis campus on a scooter. That was, yeah. I just think about that now. I'm like, I probably look like such a weirdo just on a scooter. <laughs> it's efficient. It's efficient. <laughs> so have you like tuned into any of 311's new music? I heard one of their songs recently came up on Spotify for me, but it, it wasn't like a new song. It was like, a couple years old called Space and Time. And I was like, man, this song is so cool. It's so like, just chill. No, I have, I'll have to check them out. They, yeah. you know, sort of off my radar um, with having a kid and stuff, right? Yeah. And recently, you know, I got to get back, get some of my musical street cred back. <laughs> there you go, man. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'll send you a link. You can check it out. So, <laughs> so back then in high school, you're, you're, you know, opening up for Goldfinger on stage. Is life different now than what you imagined it would be? <laughs> well, that, I mean, back then, you know, like music was my whole life. And, and I went to college to study music performance. Um, and I really, I really wanted a career as a musician. I mean, I never really thought like I was going to be a rock star, but when I got that little taste of it playing with Goldfinger, I was like, oh, this life is amazing. But, you know, um, I wasn't as probably into drugs and alcohol as I needed to be. <laughs> um, and uh, yes. Yeah, so, uh, and I was in marching band. I have to be, I mean, the book says it anyway, you're going to know that about me. You know, I did that because that was part of our thing, but like, you're never going to be a rock star when you also spend just as much time wearing those big silly hats. So, I mean, I knew that wasn't going to be my life, but some kind of music career, I, you know, I was sort of on my, on my way for then in my junior year of college, my third year of college, the saxophone teacher, I, I chose my university because of the saxophone teacher that I wanted to study with there. Um, he was, you know, just in his early thirties, he had a major stroke that paralyzed the whole left side of his body. He was in such good shape, totally unexpected fluke thing. He had been, you know, part of training for the Olympic cycling team. Um, so this was just a random, horrible thing that could happen. And so he is, uh, his, his life has, um, you know, taken a different course than what he thought, but it's incredible. Now he, he's creates one-handed instruments, uh, and, and shares them with like, you know, kids that have had, you know, birth defects or, uh, terrible accidents that they've experienced. And he's an amazing musician now with the one-handed saxophone that he's created, but it meant for me in college, I really missed out on, you know, about a year and a half, uh, at the most important time really for, for studying music to, to know that I was going to have a chance at being at the top of my game. Uh, so I was studying psychology as well. I was a dual major and I, I had great psychology mentors. It was so much fun, you know, get to basically be like a professional gossip person, you know, like, hey, did you see this crazy thing that somebody did? Did you hear about this thing? And then we have the tools of science at our disposal to try to understand, like, why did that happen? Why did somebody say that? Why did they do this kind of thing? And so, um, yeah, so I really loved that creativity and the opportunity to answer questions that I really cared about that came from studying psychology. So that sort of determined, um, you know, what I was going to do when, when I went on for my PhD. And I still play. I'm still, you know, still a musician, but not at the, not at the caliber that either used to be or that I ever hoped I would be. You're still doing creative and, and I think ground breaking work with with all of your research and, and writing this book. Uh, but I'd love to, yeah, I'd love to dig deeper into this book and talk about sure. motivation and the connection between how we see the world and all that stuff. But but before we get to that, we should probably all make sure we're on the same page on some fundamentals for vision science. So at a high level, how does this experience we call sight work? Is it just like I like see things and that's it? Like what's going on in my in my head when I'm looking at something? Yeah, I think most people think what you just said, that we point our eyes at something. And so long as it's light out, you know, during the daylight, something comes into our eyes and we and we see what's really out there. But that's not at all what happened. I mean, that that is part that is only part of what happens. Yes, of course, like light bounces off stuff out there and it comes to our eyes and it goes into our eyes and hits the back of our of our eyeball and there are special cells there that get excited about the light that it, that it picks up and it sends it to our brain but that's actually called sensation 
the light that comes into our eyes and then the little signals that get sent to our brain, that's sensation. It's not perception. So perception and seeing really requires that our brain starts making sense of the light that has come into our eyes. We need, we call upon our memories, the things that we've experienced in this world to help us sort of, you know, piece together those, those um, bits of the puzzle to take like this little bit of brightness, this little bit of a sharp edge, this color, this, you know, this movement and know like, oh, that's, that's a bird, that's a cardinal, right? So we, the process of seeing also involves our memories and our previous experiences uh, to make sense of it all. So in that sense, it's really subjective. You and I can look at the very same thing and see something really different, especially if we've had, you know, come from different backgrounds, grew up in different cultures. Um, you know, if you grew up in a society that, you know, in a, in a big city with, you know, lots of tall buildings with sharp edges and compare how your eyes work, how your brain works to somebody who grew up in, um, you know, like deserts of Africa where everything is hand constructed and there aren't really, you know, like, like sharp edges of buildings, but things are built out of, out of mud in the earth and things are more rounded. The visual experiences that people have are super different. So all of which is to say, we don't always see exactly what's out in the world. We see it through our own mind's eye, our own previous experiences shape what our interpretations of the light that's coming into our eyes. And then as a result, what our conscious, what, what our conscious experiences are of, of what we're looking at. Yeah. It's really interesting. It reminds me of this. I, I forgot where I heard it. Maybe it was in a book or something, but it was talking about how way back in like whenever it was that the Spanish had came to kind of the North American continent mm -hmm. that the natives who were sitting on the shores looking out at the horizon couldn't see the ships because they'd never been exposed to like those types of shapes or anything like that so is that kind of exactly yeah when i was referencing you know like growing up in a dense urban environment versus a more like natural landscape it's the same idea here right? i wasn't familiar with that example that you gave that's that's awesome but it's the same concept that if you haven't ever seen something like that before it's possible that you aren't even going to be able to register it you certainly won't know what it is but you might not even be able to actually see those contours um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's sad, but like you go back to like old school kind of, you know, animal research and they would raise little baby kittens in environments where, you know, um, they could only ever see in their life vertical lines. Like they, they were in, you know, small enclosed spaces and never got to venture out. <laughs> mm -hmm. Uh, and all they ever saw were vertical lines. They couldn't see horizontal lines then like when they were tested later on in these spaces where they presented them with like new visual input, kit the kittens couldn't even recognize it. Like they didn't, even, their, their eyes didn't even register it. So, yeah. yeah, I mean, it really is a testament to how our previous experience can inform our current experience today. And it's interesting. You write about it in your book, how, how all of this kind of this perception and seeing helps us achieve our goals or the different ways it can help us achieve our, our goals. So you talk about four of them in your book, Clear, closer, better. You guys can mm -hmm. check it out. Excellent book. And um, you, you, you talk about these four different ways that our, our site helps us achieve our goals. Can you talk about them at a high level? Then we'll dig into a couple of them a little bit deeper. Yeah, totally. Yeah. So I know I just nerded out on, on like the philosophy of, of perception. Um, but yeah, I mean, I get so excited about, about vision because like it is the most important and prioritized sense that we have. You know, we did a survey of like over 1700 individuals from, you know, all continents except Antarctica and the number one site that almost everybody agrees, like I couldn't live without it is my sense of sight. That, they, that there's just such a fundamental reliance on what we're seeing that people can't imagine a life without it. Most people who have sight can't imagine a life without it. And our eyes are super powerful that, you know, we can see a flickering candle like 20 miles away. We can see the International Space Station up in the sky over 250 miles away. Like our eyes are just incredibly powerful. They can transmit, uh, you know, our brain systems that process visual information can transmit information faster, like three times faster than the average internet connection in the United States. That's how quickly we're making sense of what it is that we're seeing. 
And because of all these other, you know, these cool facts and other ones that I could throw at you, that's what gets me really excited. That vision is a superpower. Like we have this superpower in all of us. We don't have to have a cape for it. We don't have to become bionic in some way. We all have this amazing superpower that we can use at our disposal to try to help us better meet our goals. And those goals can be of all different kinds. So, you know, our eyes are helping us. They're, they're letting us see opportunities to take steps in the right direction to get done what it is that we want to get done in the day. Um, and sometimes we're aware of that and sometimes we're not. Sometimes, you know, you can imagine like driving home at the end of the day after, well, back when we used to drive home from the office, <laughs> you can at least remember that. Uh, and sometimes you might have like zoned out and you realize, oh, like I'm home and I, and I wasn't even really aware of, of what I passed along the way. Of course you did it and you probably did it safely but you weren't like really paying attention to it. So that's, you know, that's kind of an anecdote or an experience we might have all had in our life where we sort of tuned out. Our eyes are still working, but we don't really have that memory of what it was. We just, you know, walked past across the last two blocks or drove past for the last few minutes, but we can become more conscious and more aware and more conscientious about what we see and how we use our eyes. So there are four tactics that I talk about in the book for us to sort of, you know, become intentionally mindful about when and how we use these different strategies. Like I call it framing the shot. You know, where are we looking? Where are we pointing our eyes? And what are we giving that kind of focused attention to? That matters. And that can make a big difference, for example, like the kinds of things that we eat and what we don't eat. It can help us with our with our eating goals. Um, besides framing it, framing the shot, we can talk about narrowed focus of attention. When do you sort of metaphorically, but also almost literally put on blinders so that what you are giving that concentrated visual focus to is just a really narrow subset of what's available in your environment? What are you going to narrow your focus of attention on? In contrast, we have a wide bracket. When are we really using our peripheral vision and allowing what's, you know, over here, what we're noticing out of the corners of our eyes to have a big impact? That's another, you know, a way that we can approach seeing that can really change the course of, of a lot of our outcomes. And lastly, so maybe I should have even started with it, the idea of materializing, right? The idea that we can make visual, make concrete things that we might otherwise just leave in our mind, right? Things that we might try to remember or things that we might um, just leave in the abstract where we make them visual, concrete, clear, present, tangible, we can see big changes. So those are the four aspects about vision that we can think about intentionally, um, that we can cultivate, teach ourselves of when to turn them on, when to turn them off, or when to switch among these different tactics. Yeah, and I love all the examples and studies that you support these uh, these tips with throughout the book, um, and and can't wait to dig into a, a few of them a little bit deeper here. But like, what is it about the strategies that we use to pursue our goals that just it makes them so freaking exhausting? Well, you know, there's uh, the American Psychological Association, one of the biggest group of psychologists who you know many of whom are working to understand the successes and failures that people have when meeting their goals asked that very question. And so what, what are you doing? What are you trying to do? What are your tactics? And some of the most commonly reported ones were talking to myself in an encouraging way or reminding myself about the importance of the goal or like nagging, like, come on, you can do it. Don't like, why, why haven't you done it yet today? And those are the things that people use as their go-to strategies. And why, why, why do people struggle then? Because those strategies are tiring right? You got to like always be on your game to be the one that's your own coach, your own motivational coach. Like, come on, you can do it. You can do it. It's like, well, I don't even have, I don't even have the effort to be that coach, let alone to, to do the thing that you're coaching me to do. Um, so that requires a lot of effort. It requires monitoring and, um, and that can be really exhausting. So people give up because the tactics that they're using almost double the workload then for trying to get the job done. So that led me then to start wondering like, well, you know, are there things that don't require as much, you know, vigilance or exertion or, you know, is there something we can habitualize that will take some of that effort out, but give us, help us reap the benefits of our, of our efforts. So that's what started to lead me to looking at visual experience. You know, maybe, 
maybe there are ways that we've like, you know, visually constructed our worlds that are making it hard, harder for us to make the right choice, whatever that right choice might be for our goals. And maybe we can play with our visual experience um, to make it easier for us to make those better, healthier choices. And so like, I think part of that might be starting at the very beginning in the sense of, you know, when we're out there pursuing goals, how do we even know that we've picked like the right goal, the right type of, of challenge? Totally. I mean, you know, especially with the, with the pandemic, this has been a really hard year for so many people of finding passion, finding purpose, um, trying, you know, to even set identify what a goal is that they want to be working on given how so much of our life has shifted. So it's, it's, it, we shouldn't undervalue the importance of being able to identify what a goal is that we want to work towards in the first place. So the first step is that is what is it that, that brings you excitement? What is it that you want in your life? And so how do you identify that? Well, first of all, carve out time to really think about it. Um, you know, time is just so weird during the pandemic, right? For some people, it's like, it's going by so fast, not the pandemic, that's taking a long time to move through, but every day is just like, you know, at a, at a sprinter's pace. And for other people with the collapse of a social world that, um, you know, time can feel so slow. So time is really weird. But I think for a lot of us, we aren't carving out time to be intentional about what do we want to do with our time? Either how do we find more of it or how do we allocate it differently? Or what do we do with it if we feel like it's just in too great of a supply? Um, and especially now that it's dragged on for so long, right? People were excited to become sourdough bread bakers or whipped coffee experts early on, but like no one's posting about that anymore. People are tired of trying so hard to find something that they want to do. So especially now, I would say like, yeah, that is a big challenge of finding something that you want. So what can you do about that? First of all, you know, one suggestion might be to like create a personal board of directors. Companies have boards of directors to help guide the path that they're going to be on. Why shouldn't we do that for ourselves? We are just as important, if not more so, than the biggest companies that rely on board of directors. So finding people with different perspectives who know different facets of us, like our personal life or our professional life or you know, those that are maybe related to hobbies or something and have a check-in maybe with each of them personally, but maybe also together, like a board of directors actually operates uh, and, and help and allow them to sort of ask the questions or for you to field ideas off of them to see like, what would be the next thing that's worth it for me that I would actually like. I had, I, I had this opportunity uh, once to do a, a sort a version of this um, with, with a company that I was working with. It was really cool. They created this like, you know, social experiment. They asked, they focused on women uh, because women um, more so than men have this idea of having it all um, as something that they have to grapple with. Right. And, uh, and so they asked women, um, what is it that you want out of your life? Like, what does your perfect life look like? What does your job look like? What is, you know, how are you managing your health? What are you doing about, you know, uh, reducing anxiety? Like, what would your perfect life look like? And then a couple of weeks later, this, um, the, the, this company that I was working with invited these women to come to an, uh, an address, an undisclosed location. And they didn't know what for, but they were told, bring somebody who's really important, somebody who might have been on their personal board of directors, show up. So some of them were really daring and did, and it ended up being a film production studio, really. That it was actually a space in Soho, it's, you know, cool neighborhood in New York that they turned into a store, but also a production, a film production unit. And the store was uh, filled with shelves that had different items, like working 10 to 20 hours a week, working 20 to 30, working 40 plus hours a week. It had a section for education, like a little bag that said, um, having, getting a bachelor's degree, getting a master's degree, getting a PhD, whatever. Um, something about kids. There was a section for kids, a little canister that said no kids, another canister that said one kid, two kids, three kids. So when they showed up, I gave them a basket and said, go shop for your perfect life. So they went to each of these sections, you know, these different shelving areas that 
had options of ba- of bags or canisters with different choices that they could make about what their perfect life would look like. And they literally took it off the shelf and put it in their basket. My ideal life would have zero kids. My ideal life would have, you know, 30 hours of work a week. Now, importantly, they were shopping with this close friend or this law school buddy or their mother, somebody from their personal board of directors who was shopping alongside them. And we didn't tell anybody like what kinds of conversations to have or how they should go about this. Um, But they did, of course, they had really interesting conversations and there was a film crew there to record (laughs) some of these conversations. And then when they came and checked out with their basket full of products, uh, I surprised them and told them, I actually have your answers from a couple of weeks ago when you told me what your ideal life would look like privately, but now you're here with your mother or now you're here with your best friend and look where the differences are. You said this in private and you said this here in the store with your personal board of directors. And we could we pulled some takeaways from this. First of all, that personal board of directors, especially when it was all women, it could have led to the stereotype that's out there in society that like, oh, women are supposed to have it all. There's a lot of pressure and competition to like, you know, look like you can do it all. But that's not what happened. This per- these personal boards of directors, these really important social relationships actually pushed people to figuring out, well, what do you want in your life? What will work best for you? And they, may- they helped them make some really challenging trade-offs. And what we found was that, you know, more than three quarters of people actually made more ambitious choices in the store than they did, than they indicated at home and private. And and most importantly, over three quarters of those decisions were in the areas that the women themselves privately had identified as being most important. So to, to put that a different way, what this what the personal board of directors had done for these women is help them to really isolate and think about what do I want? Not what does society tell me that I should want? What is it that I want? And then to decide and then encourage them to go for it. Spend less time, cut out those things that you don't, you don't want yourself and invest your time and resources in the things that you do want, even when they don't align with, um, you know, with that friends or with the mother's wants and interests. So that was so cool. And I thought it was like a great example about how, you know, having, having this sounding board can be really important for us figuring out what it is that, sh- what do we want our big goal to be? What is it that we want to work towards? And then those trade-offs that need to happen, what should I cut out then if this is the thing that I want to go for? Yeah, I remember reading that in the book. I was like, wow, that's really, really fascinating, like the results of, of that experiment. Um, but for someone like me who's like a lone wolf who doesn't have many people that I can probably put on my board of directors, just maybe my my wife and my baby is not going to have anything to do with my board of directorship. But um, like, is there a another tactic we can use? Maybe is it just like kind of just really reflecting and being introspective and maybe journaling about it and just getting our ideas out to, to figure out what we want to focus on. And I guess once we do find that one thing we want to focus on, like how do we push ourselves through to the finish line? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, a really uh, commonly used tactic is journaling or vision boards. And both of those share a property, which is like you're taking time to write down the words or vision boards. It's the idea of gather pictures, almost like, you know, scrapbooking, find, you know, find those magazines or, or images on the internet and um, either cultivate or curate like, you know, a a folder in your phone of images that reflect like, this is what I want. This looks like the kind of life that I'm looking for or journaling about it and, and uh, you know, and writing those words, writing it out of what would that look like? And then, and that's a process of materializing, right? Making concrete, putting it on a piece of paper in front of you so that you can almost like, like an outside perspective, look at it. What did I cultivate? What images are here? What words are here? Um, And then, you know, uh, be an editor. Like, is one of these more important? Should it be written in a bigger font? And are some of these ones that I could actually cross out? Because like, now that I look at it and think about it all together and think about the trade-offs that maybe have to get made to, to live this life means that I probably can't live this life. 
um, that's really useful. It allows you to almost take like a third person external perspective and become your own personal board of directors. Right. So a lot of people use vision boards, like you, like actually taking um, visual images to, um, to, to depict what it is that they want in their life. And that's a big step, right. Of identifying what do I want to go for? But the thing is, some people stop there, like, yeah, figured it out. Great. <laughs> Maybe they put it on their wall to remind themselves and to, you know, wake up each morning and, and find motivation or excitement in, in the visual images that reflect what their ideal life is like. But there's actually research that shows that that's not enough, that, you know, stopping the process of goal setting with identifying and articulating what it is that you want out of your life, not only maybe doesn't work to help you succeed, but it could actually backfire in that you're even less likely to take the steps that you need uh, to get the job done. So some colleagues of mine at New York University, uh, they, they looked at like, is this true? And why would that be the case? And they focus specifically on looking at systolic blood pressure. Now, systolic blood pressure, that's the top number on your blood pressure reading. But psychologically, it's a marker of our body's readiness to get up and go to do something. There's been really cool work done looking at um, racing horses that are you know, in the stalls right before the gates open and they're about to you know, take off with a jockey on their back. And um, vets have measured the systolic blood pressure of horses. They're standing still in their stalls. The gates are still closed. They're not going anywhere. But as, it, as you know, the, the clock ticks down and the gates are about to open, systolic blood pressure goes up and up and up for these racing horses. That as the horses know, I'm about to take off, I'm about to leap forward, I'm about to start this thing that I really want to do. Well, I don't know if they really want to do it, this thing that I'm going to do. <laughs> um, systolic blood pressure goes up, right? Their body actually isn't moving, but they're preparing themselves to move. The same thing happens with people. When we are preparing to do something, systolic blood pressure goes up, even if we're still just sitting there. And even if the thing we're about to do just requires like our cognitive focus, like, okay, I'm going to really do these math problems right now. I'm going to sit here and do these math problems. Systolic blood pressure goes up in anticipation of, of wanting to focus on, on this task at hand. So my colleagues at New York University found that when people set a goal, like creating that vision board, like thinking about daydreaming about how awesome it's going to be when I achieve X or Y, systolic blood pressure actually goes down. And that's because it's as if they've sort of mentally savored that experience of having met the goal. Like, like you visual, you know, visualize yourself on a lovely beach with your toes in the water with a nice caprina in your hand. How good does that feel? Like a lot of people use that as a relaxation tactic, right? Of putting themselves in this beautiful place, this like picture perfect location. And the same kind, and that is a relax, relaxation technique. The same thing happens when we sort of just say like, oh, this is what my ideal life is going to be like. Look how great it is when I get this promotion at work or, you know, when I find you know, my knight in silver, my shining, whatever, like the perfect guy for me. Um, that is kind of like, oh yeah, how great that life is going to be. And they relax. They're not preparing their body to do something about that. Um, so when we're talking about goal setting, it's not enough to just stop with articulating what is it that I want. We got to keep going with the process of goal setting. And my colleagues and other researchers and I have found that once you're at this stage of planning, of like identifying where do I want to be, we need to, in that same planning session, think about, okay, what are the concrete steps I need to take to get there? We got to break it down, right? We don't just leave it in the abstract. We got to think about what's going to happen this week. What do I need to get done this month? You know, sketch out that plan of what concretely I can do. And that's like not a surprising suggestion, right? A lot of people do that. But then there's a third step. And that's the idea of foreshadowing failure, that when we are planning our goals, we'll actually be better off by also simultaneously thinking about all the ways that we might fail, all the obstacles we might experience, and thinking about what we might do about it. Now, that might seem counterintuitive, like that, you know, to motivate myself and to actually increase the odds that I meet my goal, I should think about all the ways that I won't. <laughs> 
how's that going to be exciting? Like I'm trying to psych myself up to try this really challenging thing. I need my body to energize. And you're telling me, think about how hard it's going to be and all the likely ways that I'm going to fail and I'll do better. Yeah, you will. Because then when you experience a challenge along the way, you already know plan B. You've already got your backup. When you're short on time, when things aren't going right, maybe you're kind of like in your head about like, oh, this is much harder than I thought. I didn't realize this was going to happen. You don't have the time then. You don't have the mental resources. You're not in as good a place to try to figure out, how am I going to work through this? How am I going to get back on the bandwagon? What will I do now? If you already have that plan in advance, you're more likely to succeed. I know I keep going on, but let me give you one last example of just exactly how that, how that works. So Michael Phelps, amazing athlete, right? Uh, Back in 2008 at the Beijing Olympics, he was on the brink of doing something no Olympic athlete had ever done, right? In the history of the Olympics, which is win eight gold medals in a single Olympic game. He had already won seven at the time of this story. And he was like, you know, at the edge of the pool, ready to dive in to to win his eighth gold medal if he if he won this 200 fly. So that's four laps, like back and forth, back and forth, right? That's it. Then if he and if he wins, then he's won eight gold medals and makes Olympic history. Well, as he dove into the pool, his goggles started to leak. By the time he was in his last leg, his goggles were completely filled with water and he was blind. He was swimming blind. Now, I would never be in the Olympics. I'll never get there, especially in swimming. (laughs) So, uh, but I'm pretty sure if I was, I would totally freak out, right? This would be like, oh my God, what am I supposed to do? But he didn't freak out because he had already foreshadowed this possibility. It was a part of his routine practice for when he's working on, on his goals to think about what could happen, what could go wrong. My goggles might not work. In fact, sometimes his coach would like at the last minute, rip his goggles off of his head and smash them, step on them on the ground so that he would have to swim, practicing swimming without being able to see. So in this uh, final leg of the 200 fly in 2008, when his goggles were now completely filled with water, he calmly turned to his backup plan. And that was counting his strokes because he knew how many strokes it would take for him to get from one length of the pool to the other, from one end to the other end of the pool. He did that, counted his strokes. He won the 200 fly. He won his eighth gold medal and he would go on to win 15 more gold medals in his career. So there you go. <laughs> uh, you know, it's, yeah. he's, he's an incredible example, uh, first of all, of amazing, amazing athletic prowess, but the importance of foreshadowing failure and, and planning for obstacles in advance. So much good stuff there. Like, I hope everybody's listening. Go back and listen to that. Take some notes. So, so many questions I have based on that. But I mean, I, I just wish that me thinking about the donut upstairs and savoring it in my mind would stop me from being motivated <laughs> to go up there and eat it. Uh, but but yeah, th- that point about foreshadowing failure, that's really interesting. I mean, that's even like an ancient kind of idea. You know, Stoics used to talk about that premeditating, you know, premeditatio malorum, whatever they call it, premeditating mm-hmm. failure and and thinking about how you'd, you'd react to that. I, I was reading a book, might have been two or three months ago, four months ago, maybe, uh, Gabriel Edigen's book, Rethinking Positive Thinking. It was a lot of the same um, same same things about that, like, you know, the obstacle in the way becomes the way type of, type of attitude. Um, yeah, so much to get into there. Um, but I, I kind of want to step back a little bit from that, that this idea of this narrow focus. I, I had a specific question around that. Like it makes sense to me intuitively. Like, so, so I, I live in Winnipeg. It gets really cold and I often go out in walks when it's freezing cold outside and there's long stretches of, um, you know, of, of just walking pads and to keep myself motivated, I focus, okay, I'm just going to walk until that next tree, walk until that next tree. All right, cool. I'm going to keep on walking until I hit that corner and then I'm almost home. Right. So this narrow focus concept that, that you talk about in your book, like I'm, how do I use that narrow focus? Because a lot of my audience, we're knowledge workers, right? A lot of the goals we have is deploying a model into production, deploying machine learning models, like, you know, into produ- it, it, it's, there's not like a tangible mm-hmm. visual thing that we can help narrow our focus. So hopefully my question is making sense. Essentially, it's first, can you help us understand what narrow focus is? And as knowledge workers, how can we use narrow focus to help us achieve our goals? Totally. Yeah. So I mean, your, your illustration of narrowed focus is exactly what, what we talk about. And I started this work um, by, you know, interviewing Olympic athletes, you know, fat, like fastest runners that um, in the world. 
And I went into it, you know, thinking like, okay, I wonder what they're doing. What are they looking at? You know, when they're, when they're competing and I thought like, they're going to be looking at the competition, right? They're going to be like incredible multitaskers in a sense that they can, you know, uh, know where they're going, but also they know where everybody else is in relation to them. And I bet there's something special about, about what their eyes are doing. And I was totally wrong. I mean, they are really special and probably their eyes are too, but my thoughts about where are they looking? I was completely off. They tell me that when they want to run faster and, and, and what, and what they are doing then is they're focusing on the finish line, or if it's a longer race, they're, fo- they're breaking it down. Like you said, like they're, they're focusing on, you know, the bend, the bend in the track until they get there. And then they choose a new target and they're just focusing on that. They're actually not paying attention to where the competition is. That's what these interviews suggested. And then we, so we thought, okay, I, you know, I was wrong. <laughs> Fine. You know, great. Must <laughs> like, that's a lot of, that's the whole p- process of science is, is updating, but I wonder, can, can we teach other people to do what these Olympic athletes do? And will that help improve their performance? And so it, in your case, it sounds like that is a tactic you use to help push yourself a little bit farther, especially when, you know, the weather is uh, not in your favor and you might want to give up sooner, but you know, you really need to get some more steps in. And it does work. It worked. It sounds like it works for you. uh, And it does work for a lot of other people to help them move farther, uh, have it hurt less and move faster. Um, But, you know, this that's physical distance, right? We're talking about like literally getting yourself to go another half mile or something. But there's other forms of distance as well. Temporal distance is is another big um, aspect of of regulating our goals. How do we pursue our goals? we got to manage our time. So for a lot of people, um, the goals that we really want to achieve are not going to be achieved today or this week or this month. They actually might take a couple of years for us to realize. And that can be the challenge because it's, I got to think about what am I doing today and realize that my choice today is going to have an impact in in two years time or five years time. Uh, you know, when we think about health, that's, um, that's where the idea of time really comes into play. Like my choices today about what I eat for lunch are going to impact my health when I'm 60, like 20 years from now, you know, the odds that I get to see my son have kids, you know, what I eat for lunch today can have that impact for uh, later on. And that's really challenging to connect today's choices to that far off distant future. But oftentimes our goals require that, that we consistently make the choices today that will be beneficial for us in 5, 10, 20 years time. Um, You know, a great example of this idea, it it comes in the realm of like um, investing for retirement. Um, This is something we all should be doing early on in life so that we have a great retirement years, 30, 40 years down the line. But that's really challenging to like, you know, in your 20s and your 30s to be putting aside some chunks of money when you have, you know, a first mortgage or a car payment or you got a new family that you got to support. Putting aside money for yourself that you won't be able to use for 30 or 40 years is really challenging. But every analyst tells us that if we can find a small amount to stow to stow away early on in life, we'll be much better off because of how compound interest works. So what do we think? Okay, how can we solve this problem with, you know, with, with visual experience? In the same way that, you know, if a distance looks really far, we probably aren't going to try to run to it. But if it looks closer, maybe, maybe we will. Is there a way for us to sort of trick ourselves to narrow narrow that perception of distance? You know, that separating uh, my forty year old self from my sixty five year old self. How can I make that seem not so far but closer to now? Or if I have a goal that's just five years off, like you know, this is what I want. This is where I want to be financially, or this is where I want to be in terms of my physical or mental health in a couple of years time. How can I connect that far off future to the here and now? Well, narrowed focus of attention can do that. It can constrict that um, that perception of distance. When we narrow our focus of attention, what it did for the people that we studied who were exercising was make that finish line look closer. It created a visual illusion of proximity. Narrowed focus like keeps the distractors away. We're not paying attention to all the little milestones or roadblocks that, that are along the path. We're just focused on the finish line. And that makes it seem closer to us. And when it seems closer, we don't think it's going to be as hard to get there. It seems more relevant. It seems more tangible and possible. 
that happens with physical distance and it helps people run or walk better, but it also works for temporal distance. It can help connect that far off future to the here and now and helps people make choices today that might not benefit them until far into the future. Yeah, I think I remember that uh, you showed some of your students aged pictures of themselves to help them to think about how to like save for the future essentially, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So that's, you know, we were looking at saving for retirement. None of my 20 year olds were saving for their retirement because they said it just seems so far off. It's like, Mm -hmm. you know, it's way too far away to be concerned about that. Um, But, you know, like you were saying, I took I took a picture of their face. I morphed it with Maya Angelou or Dan Rather or some other famous people that had really nice lives. I showed them a picture of their face. Most of them were horrified to see what white hair and wrinkles on their, you know, beautiful little 20 year old faces look like. Um, But then but it gave them a concrete uh, visualization. It materialized what that future self would look like. Um, and then I asked them, like, are you ready to say, you do think you'll start saving for retirement with your next paycheck? And all of them were like, yeah, I get it. Yes. I see the importance of this. It doesn't seem so far off. And this isn't specific to retirement, right? This, this tactic of just try to mentalize or visualize or put ourselves in that place of that distant future. And we can, we can connect the dots then between who I am now who that person is in the future, who's going to reap the benefits of my choices today. And it can sort of, you know, compress, compress that, that psychological distance that might otherwise lead us to, you know, succumb to to temptations today that we might regret later on. And so I know that sometimes when I set a goal for myself that, and it is far off in the distance temporally, or maybe it could even be closer in, in time distance and temporal distance, I might have like a very vague notion of what being successful would mean to me. Like like starting off with just a vague notion, like, Oh my gosh, like I want to buy a business and have it be successful. Like, okay, what does being successful mean? Right. So like, how do we concretely identify a definitive moment of success before starting our journey? Yeah, I think that that's important. And I think acknowledging the fact that you don't, you might not know what success in 10 years is going to look like. So don't have that be the goal that is driving you, right? Okay, fine. I want to be successful in 10 years time. Well, what's my goal for this quarter then, right? And that can and should be concrete. And then when you've, when you've accomplished that, or when you've hit that milestone, either in terms of time or in terms of success, then you need to reevaluate you know, becoming our own accountant, monitoring our progress, that is a really important aspect of goal setting that oftentimes people um, either don't find a strategy that works for them, or they don't carve out time to do that at all. It's like, all right, here's the goal, you know, and when when time comes, I either give myself a thumbs up or thumbs down for having met it, or I just move on, right? Because life just keeps going. So, You know, you might be like, okay, great. I'm glad I got this done. Like next, what's the next thing that I need to do? And and we might not be thinking intentionally or in a long-term manner about what that next mile marker milestone should be. So I do agree with you that it's okay to not necessarily know what does success in 10 years time look like, but we might want to have some sort of vague idea, but then set something that is more concrete, manageable, and within a smaller timeframe and take these opportunities to assess where am I at? Do I have a better sense of where I want to be in, in six years time now that a couple of years has progressed um, and take that time for reflection. What I think people do often when they're reflecting on their progress or trying to hold themselves accountable is that they think pretty myopically in a, you know, in a smaller chunk of time than maybe is ideal. And, it, and doing that of thinking like, okay, what was this week like? Or just, you know, black and white, did I hit this goal or did I not in the time frame that I specified? That's, that's myopic thinking. That's a narrowed focus used in a way that's not advantageous because our memories are faulty, right? So when I was, you know, when I was writing this book, I decided I'd try all these tactics that I'm talking about on myself and in the pursuit of a new goal. And my new goal was going to be to learn to play drums. I wanted to like really be able to nail one rock song. I wanted to be a rock drummer, but a one hit wonder. And I'd never played drums before. Um, And so this was a big challenge for me to take on, but one that I'd be like really proud of myself if I could master. 
Um, and so as I, you know, set this goal and I'm writing about it in the book and I am going to play a show to hold myself accountable for making sure that there is a, a time point that I'm an end for this, I'm, I'm going to perform on this day. So either I make it or I don't, that was important for me to have that kind of accountability in the moment. I just thought I am getting nowhere each day that goes past each week that goes past. This is like nagging on me. This is looming large. Like people are going to come to hear me play. And I am like nowhere close to being performance ready. And I never felt like I was making progress. So I thought like, okay, I got to figure out, you know, what is it looking like? What's working for me? What's not? So I set up this app on my phone to ping me a couple times a day and ask me, did you practice drums since I last asked you? And it, most of the time I said no, but if I said yes, then it would ask like, and tell me about it. How do you, how do you feel? How do you feel right now after having just played drums? And then I did that for a month and downloaded my data of all the times that it asked me, all the data that I gave it. And then I analyzed, I'm a data scientist, right? So I analyzed a month's worth of my reports. And what I found was really surprising to me because when I thought about it, I thought like, okay, like this is just going to be confirmation. This will be hard evidence that I'm doing a bad job at practicing the drums and learning them. And I thought that might motivate me to have this external accountability system prove to me that I'm not doing enough. But actually what I discovered was that I was practicing more than I remembered. And actually I was showing improvement over the course of the month. At the beginning, I was saying things to myself like, yes, I practiced my, I practiced drums and I cried through the whole thing. That's where I started at the beginning of the month. But by the end, it was like, yeah, I practiced my drums and that wasn't so bad. Oh, I kind of felt proud. My husband gave me a compliment. He's actually a rock drummer. And so it's like, okay, that's in the span of a month. There was actually progress that was being made. But in the moment, I never felt it because all I knew was like, it's not show, I'm not ready to go. This isn't performance worthy. This isn't showtime yet. I still have a lot further to go. And I was forgetting the progress that I had made because to me, what was looming large were the failures, were the mistakes of like that I wasn't where I wanted to be. And I wasn't mentally giving myself credit for the accompli you know, accomplishments as small as they were that actually are critical for making progress. So for me, you know, that was a tactic that was, that was important. That's an example of the wide bracket idea also, and taking some time to reflect on actual progress. That's important of like, especially, you know, you started the question by saying, what if I have a goal that's in 10 years time, and I'm not really sure what it's going to look like. Reflecting on progress is, is an important step of, um, of goal pursuit and making and habitualizing that, you know, setting up quarterly check-ins with yourself, with your board of directors, your personal board of directors to reflect on real data, not just your, your memories of where you started, where you're at and how far you have to go. While making sure that you account for any possible failures that you might encounter along the way, right? That is important to do that exactly. as well. Exactly. So I remember, I remember reading that part in your book. So I like, I'm much more analog. Like I, I just, I like paper. It just, it helps me for some reason. And I, I've got a weekly thing that I do, right? Just every week I'll sit down on Sunday yeah. and I'll plan out what Monday, Tuesday and Wednesday is going to look like. And then on Wednesday, I'll, I'll reassess the rest of the week. Um, and just, you know, I have this on, on front of my desk right here and I see it every day. Okay. Well, did I read the book that I was supposed to read? Did I do this thing? Did I do that thing? Whatever. Right. Um, and I used to, I used to just toss this sheet out every week. Uh, but after reading that part in your book, I've been keeping my sheets. So um, just to give me visual progress and to see, okay, well, wow, a few months ago I was, you know, doing this and now I'm doing this. And I think it's going to help me realize the things that I don't like to do or that I keep pushing off so that I can just go and outsource those, right? Because if it's constantly like, you know, like there's something that was on my thing three weeks ago that is still incomplete this week. And I'm like, okay, well, that's probably an indication that's that's something I should just outsource because I don't want to spend time doing that, apparently. Um, was I kind of using that tactic in the right way? That's amazing. Yeah, you're absolutely using the tactic. You're using the tactic of material materializing. You you aren't just relying on your memory to try to get the stuff done that you need. You're using wide bracket framing because you said you plan out your whole week, right, in advance. And you're so you're thinking about Sunday on Monday, or you're thinking, yeah, whatever the time frame is. And that's so important. We did a, a version of that also uh, with, with students that I was working with and people who use that tactic rather than the alternative of like, 
thinking about today, like going to bed, thinking about what's on tap for tomorrow, waking up in the morning and looking at your calendar for the day and trying to schedule in the things that you need to do. People who used your tactic of that wide bracket, thinking about time, found two and a half more hours in their week to do the things that they really needed to get done. When we, when we reflect, when we calculated the number of hours that they spent on, on goal relevant tasks. So you're doing what the evidence says is a really great tactic to do of the materializing and the wide bracket framing, but you're also uh, reviewing your progress over time and adapting as your, as your calendar changes, as your schedule changes on Tuesday, you're revisiting. That's important. That's an aspect of monitoring your progress and maintaining that flexibility. That's still important. And and that's so cool too, that then you're holding on to those papers. I started doing this also going back analog style um, during the pandemic, because I just started to feel so overwhelmed about, about a screens, right. And like, and not just how much time we're spending on screens, but, but, you know, you keep, if you keep a digital to do, to do list, at least the ways that I use it, it's like, you check it when you're done and it disappears, but like no one's to-do list is ever just blank, right? Because because stuff keeps getting added on, even as you're checking them off, right? So you never get that moment of satisfaction of knowing like I've accomplished something, right? Because they disappear when they're done, they disappear, but you never hit to-do list zero, inbox zero, right? Uh, and so I started doing the same thing that that you suggested or that you're using, which is like I went analog style, I write it down, and then I don't throw away those papers because when I need a, a hit of motivation or a sense of like, okay, I'm actually making progress here, I flip back on the previous weeks and look like, oh, actually look at what I did get done this month, right? Even though I still have a lot to do. Uh, so I think it's helpful for finding motivation when you're feeling like overwhelmed, and you're like doubting whether you can get the job done, well, here's hard proof that you can, because look at what you've already, what you've accomplished over these past few weeks. But I love your idea also of using it diagnostically to figure out what is it that I'm not going to get to, because I just don't want to, (laughs) And, and then figuring out a solution to that, right? I love that. I haven't heard of people using that before, and I haven't, but I will as soon as we get off this call. (laughs) I'm, like I'm all about materializing. I, I feel that that helps me a lot. And I think maybe that's part of the reason why I prefer physical books because I like marking on them. I like um, just putting notes and stuff in them. And I, and you know, it, it to me, it's like, I, I, I buy a bunch of books, Pro- probably four to five books get delivered to my house every week. And, you know, of the books that I have laying around the house, it's probably 60, 65% of them that I've read, but it's just a visual reminder to me that I don't know anything like there's still knowledge that I haven't touched and still more out there that I need. So that, that really kind of helps uh, put things in perspective for me. So I use materializing in that way, just as a reminder that you don't know anything, there's still more that you don't know, yeah. but also uh, you'll notice there's like a, a, a board back here. Right. And I've got a guitar back here that I have not touched in, in forever. So I'm wondering when we do like these, these this vision boards, I've got a Kanban board here to do list that's off to the side in terms of motivation to do these things, would it make more sense for me to to move these not from behind or to the side, but just you know, in front of me, even if they're on the other side of the room? Yeah, totally. Because you probably habitualized to it, right? Like that guitar has been there forever, so you figured out how you can move through your life without really having to process it, right? Like you don't have to move. Well, you're not kicking it. You know, if you made it become more present, more salient for you, um, you know, and you know that you do want to practice more then that might work. So maybe, maybe putting it in front of you rather than behind you, or maybe putting it in your chair, like at the end of the day, right. And you know, I'm going to wake up and I'm going to go sit down in this chair and like check my email or whatever, put the guitar in your chair so that what you are intentionally going for now, there's an obstacle in your way, but that obstacle is the thing you actually want to be engaging with more. So that's using the idea of framing visual framing. What do you put in your frame? What are you putting in your field of view? And can you do that intentionally in a way that increases the odds that you make the choice that you want? And for you, it's to like, I want this guitar in my hand. I want to practice this thing more. Well, if you put it in your chair and you have to put it in your hand to move it, maybe there's a, maybe there'll be an extra like thought of like, ah, rather than just taking it and putting it down, I can sit here for five minutes. It's already at the chair. It's in my hand. I can spend five minutes now. You know, or the other thing is like, use your calendar, right? Those things that are like, 
you know, an intentionally, intentionally schedule time for it. So, you know, we put things in our calendar, like my meeting with you is in my calendar. I will not forget it. I will prioritize it. I work the rest of my day around what I put into my calendar, including this meeting with you. We do that for doctor's appointments or, you know, meetings with bosses that we know we can't forget, but we rarely do that for our things that, that are just relevant for personal growth. I think, you know, the the odds that we schedule as many things for as much time as we would like to be doing them, if they're just for us, it almost feels like I shouldn't use my calendar that way um, or that it's not as important. Practicing my guitar isn't as important as, um, you know, meeting up with this person who's going to promote my my, you know, my blog or something like that. But it is, if it matters to you and if it's making you feel guilty or if it's making you feel like this isn't the life that I want because I'm not finding time for it, then you should put it into your calendar, right? So that it it does get just as um, a place of importance in your day and how you allocate your time is all the other things that you still need to do. But so, but practicing your guitar is just as important. So why can't it get that same place of prominence? I like that. I think I'm definitely going to try that tactic. And I think the first song that, that I'll do is, will probably go something like this. I don't want to lose your love tonight. We can remix the drums with the guitar and maybe do a live performance on YouTube. I don't, I don't know. Right. Maybe. Like yeah, that, totally. Happen. Yeah. I'd be up for that. <laughs> yeah. That was the song that, that I spent my year trying to learn is the yeah. outfields your love. Yeah. Yes. And you guys can read about that in the book. It's a very, very, interesting <laughs> adventure that you had during that process but okay so like what the flox is flox and i said yeah flox and ox and i hill pillification that is another thing i had to learn how to say when i was recording the audiobook version uh i i i was so annoyed at myself you know sitting in the studio reading the book out loud and then i got to that word in the chapter title and i was like oh why did I do this to myself? It was so easy, well, relatively easy to write, but like impossible to say. So I had to work with two vocal coaches to figure out how do you say that. And then have, having learned the word, I'm not going to forget it. <laughs> uh, I will make sure I don't forget it. Um, so phloxanox and It's a it's a made up word, but it's a it's a word that's out there um, that that people use. It was you know supposedly made or created by a bunch of you know like nerdy Elon students trying to piece together little bits fragments of meaning to to create the idea of um you know of of uselessness of of waste of wrongness and and it's and it's that idea of like um you know just a, a little scrap of something that that means nothing why is it why is this in the book <laughs> because it is something that we are so motivated as humans to avoid we don't want to become floxa noxa naya hilapophilicated we don't want to become thought of as useless, of useless, of, of wasted, of nothing, of nothing. We really need to feel like there's meaning. We have meaning, we have purpose, and we're good. So that is, you know, that is that is something that we are driven towards is to think well of ourselves and have other people think well of us. But then it turns out that positive feedback can sometimes backfire, right? When we're pursuing our goals. What what is it about that? Yeah, right. So this idea that we don't want to get Fox and Knox and Nia Hill pillificated uh, can lead us to prefer positive feedback. When we're parents, we might think like, you know what, I'm just going to like when my kid does something great, I'm going to totally tell him like, oh, that was amazing. You stuck a pee up your nose. That's great that you have the ability to pinch that little pee and stick it up your nose. Right. Okay. Maybe that's an exaggeration. My son did do that. I didn't praise him for it um, because we almost had to go to the ER for it. But it is, but it's the idea that like, you know, we, we want positive feedback. We feel good when we get positive feedback, we probably give it more than negative feedback because it's scary to maybe hurt someone's feelings. If if that's how we construe um, negative feedback and there's, you know, a stigma about receiving and getting negative feedback. But the thing is that like, if all we're doing is focusing on the good, it can be, it can stymie our ability to learn. Right. So think about, I think it makes most sense when you think about like restaurants and and dining out. We love sharing pictures of like 
well, back in the old, back in the pre-COVID days of when we could go out to restaurants, we have this beautiful entree, we snap a picture of it, we put it up on social media. That's great. We can, we can remind ourselves of how great this meal was and the memories that we have associated with this delicious food. But if you get food poisoning somewhere, don't you also want to remember that? Like maybe like I'm not encouraging people to like take pictures of like them throwing up in the toilet to remind themselves and tell others about a restaurant that they got food poisoning from. But that's a great example of how, you know what, the bad is just as important for learning, maybe even more so than the good. Because if we don't remember that that restaurant that gave us food poisoning and we keep going back and they haven't changed anything, we might just keep getting sick. Right. So there are advantages to learning about the things um, that aren't so great about our experiences and about ourselves. But we just have this human tendency to avoid floxinox and nihil pilification, right? We have a tendency to avoid the bad. And I think a lot of that comes back, you know, to the ideas that you referenced before with Carol Dweck um, and, uh, and, and and growth mindset that we think, if we think that failure means something about our ability, about our core character, which a lot of people do, then that could be a reason why we avoid getting negative feedback or having people tell us like, where did you come up short? That would be really useful. So I don't make the same mistake again, so that I know where I should invest my resources so that I can grow most. But people avoid that because of the stigma about failing. But if we think about it differently, it's not failure to know that there's room for improvement, to remember our mistakes, to have people help us work through, identify and work through those. We actually might be far better off in the long run. So we don't need to think about those blips as failures. We can think about them as learning opportunities. Like if I want to go far, then where can I go far when there's the most room for growth and people are helping support my journey there? So, you know, that's, that's, that's something that we should be aware of, that we might have a tendency to like pull towards the positive feedback, but we might be better off by keeping a greater openness for the negative. Absolutely love that. Uh, yeah, just that idea of just wanting to hear a little bit of, not a little bit, but just give me the real raw, like tell me what I'm doing wrong and give me an opportunity to improve. Like I, yeah. I love that kind of stuff in my life. And I think it takes a little bit of practice to get to getting used to. Yeah, totally. I mean, you got to have like an environment of psychological safety, right? Where you know that like, if I get negative feedback, it doesn't mean I'm not going to get the promotion. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that now they think I'm not capable of doing something different or that I'm not the right person for the next job, that you need to have that environment, um, you know, that culture cultivated before um, that kind of openness to the to the negative is really going to be possible. And companies that have done that, they actually show amazing out- outcomes. So like some of the most creative companies, the most innovative companies out there, they have created that psychological safety, that culture where it's okay to share and even to ask for negative feedback, uh, because it won't mean that you're going to be the next person fired, right? But they realize that if we really want to innovate, if we don't want to continue to invest resources in something that's not working, we have to be able to to call ourselves on a mistake and to call others on, on their mistakes. So how do they do that? Well, you know, they have team meetings or they have department division meetings or even company-wide meetings where they're not saying like, hey, look at this amazing thing that we did this month. The whole meeting is about, hey, this is where we're really struggling and we actually think we should cut this idea, that we should kill this project. And everybody thinks about it. It's either like, oh, you know what? Actually, we were up against that problem before and we can help you solve it. Or it's, uh, you know what? I think you're right. I think this project should get killed. And that's great because we won't keep throwing resources, time and money and personnel at something that doesn't really have legs. Right. So they actually ha- they institutionalize the practice um, and normalize that experience of sharing struggles and calling for help and allowing. And, and what they do is when they find these ideas that like, you know, should get killed um, or that that need extra investment, they actually reward. This is, happens at Google, Google X, the division of Google that is you know responsible for some of the greatest innovations like like um, contact lenses that can monitor for for diabetes. Uh, Google X, like, you know, applauds, like team leaders applaud groups and teams that have found an idea that they think is worth not investing further in. 
you know, they don't, they don't get fired. They don't lose their job. They get, they get accolades. They also get time off. They also get financial bonuses so that they can have all the resources that they need to think about what the next big idea is going to be. So those are ways, you know, not everybody is in the position to offer time off or pay or to create that kind of culture. But if you are a leader, if you are a team leader, you can, you can, help normalize that experience of sharing obstacles and failures. When I work with my team, you know, every time they're like, you know, preparing to deliver a big presentation, they're super nervous. You know, their reputation is on the line when they're presenting. I try to tell them about the things that I really struggled with. You know, you saw me present a couple months ago, but did you know that like my heart was racing and I thought I was going to (laughs) die when I first started that just happens. And here's what I did to move through it. So that it's, you know, you normalize that process as the leader or as the manager to say like, stuff happens, you know, we struggle, I struggle and you still think well of me or to, or another thing you can do is, uh, is say like, here's the mistake that I made last week, you know, or I don't think I handled the situation you were up against as well. What could I have done better for you? So you make that process of talking about problems not stigmatizing. You can set the example to normalize, normalize those kinds of conversations. Oh, I absolutely love that. Absolutely love that. Um, man, so many other questions that I would love to ask, but we are winding down on time here. You guys check out the book, Clear, Closer, Better, How Successful People See the World. It's available on Amazon and on Audible, and it's read by you on Audible. So that makes it even more fun to, to listen to. So last formal question before we jump into a real quick random round, and that is, it is 100 years in the future. What do you want to be remembered for? Of expanding people's toolbox of things that they have available uh, to help them overcome some of the biggest challenges of life, to realize that you don't need to spend a ton of money to change your life, that you already have the tools that you need to find a new way forward. You definitely have helped expand my toolbox and given me a new idea to pick up that guitar that's been gathering dust. So I'm going to give that a shot and report back to you, and uh, we'll get that we'll get that virtual duet uh, awesome. scheduled up. Uh, let's go ahead and jump into the random round. So I got to ask, who was the drummer of the Canadian rock band that you had hanging near your drum set that you were oogling? Uh, Neil Peart from Rush. Okay, nice. I I would have thought it was like, uh, oh, what was that? Uh, my God, I'm blanking on the name of the band. Such a bad Canadian. Uh, uh, the Tragically Hip, I thought it would have been. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I am not up on Canadian uh, rock except for Rush. So, yeah. yeah. Ne- neither am I. I'm not even a real Canadian. I've been <laughs> so let's pull up the random question generator. We'll do a few out of here. First awesome. question, what's on your bucket list this year? I want to climb a mountain. I am stuck being inside. I want a sense of accomplishment. I want to be on top of a mountain this year. Anyone in particular? No, whichever one I can get to with uh, <laughs> with quarantine restrictions in place. <laughs> uh, what makes you cry? Oh, seeing my child grow up. Oh, honestly, I each know. week, yeah, each week he learns something new. His vocabulary expands, and I'm proud of him. And I shed a little tear. Yeah, it's crazy. They really do grow fast. It's yeah. yeah. What's one of your favorite comfort foods? Mm. Oh, oh, I got some leftover carrot cake uh, in my fridge from Easter. And I got to say, that's, that's probably one of them. Or bacon. So uh, yeah. my, wife, my wife absolutely loves carrot cake. That is her favorite yeah. cake. Do a, a last random question here. What's the last book you gave up on and stopped reading? Oh, that's a different kind of question. I don't think I should say. <laughs> um, I, oh, I feel bad about throwing somebody under the bus. <laughs> I don't want to say. Okay. It was a fiction book. I loved this author's first, like the first thing she ever uh, published. And I have read it so many times. And so then I got another one, just random choice. Um, and I didn't like it. So I gave up on it, even though I was probably one of her biggest fans with her earliest work. So I don't want to say. <laughs> no worries. What, what but it was you? fiction. It was fiction. Yeah. What are you uh, currently reading? Um, 
Oh man, I've gotten, I mean, I need some distractions. So uh, Lisa Jewell, she is just like this mystery writer, really prolific mystery writer. And I just need something to escape. It's real escapism, but she's such an excellent storyteller in such a different way too. She tells you what the like big thing is in the very first few pages, but then it takes the whole book for you to figure out how did we get there? How did you, how did that thing come to be? So I just like how it, it takes the formula and turns it on its head. And I know during the writing of this book, it was probably the song, Your Love, that you had on repeat over and over. What do you got on repeat nowadays? Um, um, I mean, we got a lot of rush on repeat that will always be on repeat in, in our house. So, yeah. Right. So, Emily, how can people connect with you? Where can they find you online? You, uh, I write for Psychology Today. So when you want some more tips about what's happening in the world and, and how you can respond to it, you can find me on Psychology Today, LinkedIn, everything I write, I post up there also. So if you, you know, want to see more ideas, you can check me out there. I'll definitely include links to those in the show note. Emily, thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule to be on the show. Appreciate having you here. Thanks for this conversation. Lots of fun. Lots of fun.